morning, everyone, and welcome to the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District's Green Infrastructure Grant Program Pre-Proposal Workshop for our 2022 uh, grant program year. Uh, I'm Matt Sharber. I'm the Deputy Director of Watershed Programs, and we've got a, a couple hour uh, workshop session here uh, for prospective applicants uh, to prepare you uh, and give you some insights uh, into hopefully building uh, a competitive application uh, for our 2022 uh, funding round. Go to Chris. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get into the program. I'll just remind everybody that we're on a Teams uh, virtual meeting, so if you can please keep your microphones muted. Um, you don't need your cameras on. Uh, the presenters uh, will uh, and speakers will have their cameras on when they're speaking. Um, we will be um, monitoring the, the chat so if you have a question uh, or a comment, uh, please uh, put that into the chat. And if we can work that question into that portion of the presentation, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll field the questions during during a break period, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how the uh, morning will unfold with the agenda here in the next couple of slides. So I just want to take a moment to uh, remind everyone of our of the sewer district's purpose for uh, implementing the green infrastructure grants program in the combined sewer area. Uh, as many of you uh, know, uh, the district service area uh, has a significant uh, portion, about 71 square miles of combined sewer that extends through most of Cleveland and into uh, about 10 or so uh interring communities uh in the district service area and our main goal is to treat stormwater uh, at its source and make best efforts to remove that from the combined system uh, to complement our efforts to uh, combat combined sewer overflow uh in in the region next slide chris so I'm, I'm pleased, we're pleased uh, this year uh, to announce that we've uh, continued to evolve the Green Infrastructure Grants Program, and we've added the de design only uh, projects component uh, to this year's uh, funding round, uh, which will enable uh, applicants uh, the opportunity to seek grant funding to uh, simply work through uh, their design. Um, so if you have a concept, uh, but you may not yet have uh, funding secured for potential uh, or future construction, but you're in a in a position where you'd like to carry forward with the design. Uh, this design only option, uh, which is a grant award, uh, can help facilitate uh, that design effort. And then what we would like to see happen is that you come back and compete in a subsequent round uh, for construction dollars to actually uh, implement and, and build that that project. So there'll be more, more details uh, on on this new option uh, within the presentations. So just to give you an overview of where we where we've been and and how far we've come, uh, the 2022 round will actually be our our ninth year of the program. Uh, as you can see in this table, uh, the program started in 2014. In the early years, uh, we uh, rotated every other year with grant funding opportunities, and now you can see from 2018 through 21, uh, we've been steady in terms of offering funding each year, uh, and we're happy to uh, announce that we have secured um, and projected to be able to fund uh, through our next five-year rate cycle uh, an annual award. Um, in, in the neighborhood of, of $1.5 million a year. So the program is growing. Uh, we continue to get good applications, um, good partners, uh, great projects uh, being constructed uh, throughout the service area. Again, reducing stormwater uh, entering the uh, combined sewer system. So the agenda for today, um, we're going to start with uh, grant eligibility and Rob Storkel, our community discharge permit program specialist, uh, will cover that information. Uh, so please uh, pay close attention to that in terms of the eligibility, particularly where you've, your, your project may fall in, in terms of uh, its connectivity uh, to the combined sewer system. So there are some nuances there that, that Rob will cover to make sure that we're all 
uh, and good understanding of how uh, we evaluate project locations and their connectivity to the uh, combined sewer system. Then uh, Crystal Davis, uh, our, our watershed program specialist, will go over our grant program criteria. Uh, and then following uh, Crystal, Katie Wagg, who is our assistant general counsel uh, in the district's uh, legal department, will go over our uh, agreement language, uh, which is essentially our contract with you as an applicant uh, to carry out the uh, green infrastructure project. So she'll provide some, some good insights on the legal aspects of our program. And then following that, uh, Chris Hartman, who is our stormwater technical specialist, uh, will provide uh, uh, a lot of information uh, on the technical requirements of our grant program. Um, and so there'll that'll, that'll be some good information there. Following that, Crystal will come back and cover the reimbursement procedure. So I'm sure you all will be very attentive during that process. As you know, this is a grant reimbursement uh, program, so an applicant needs to be able to financially um, front, pay for the design and construction of the uh, of the uh, project, and then seek reimbursement through our reimbursement program. And then finally, uh, Jessica Cotton, uh, who is our GIS technician and our GIS services work group, uh, will cover our, our grant uh, program uh, forms that are online and uh, our uh, green infrastructure story map where you can find more information on past projects that we've awarded and, and fact sheet information about all those projects. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rob Storkel, uh, again, who is our community discharge permit program specialist, and he's going to cover our grant eligibility. So thank you very much, Matt. I am Rob and I do the plan review. I'm part of the team that does plan review here at the district. My responsibility is primarily to look at these incoming projects and then assign them to the appropriate reviewer. Uh, so I tend a lot of time looking at maps and locations of projects. So there is a comprehensive plan by the sewer district that's called Project Clean Lake to reduce combined sewer overflows. This project has included wastewater treatment plant enhancements, increased storage within the system, these large tunnels that are being constructed, and the Green Infrastructure Grant Program, which treats the stormwater near the source. So the project must be in an area that will have an effect on the combined sewer system. Here is a, a map showing the gold area is in the northernmost, the older part of the city is the combined sewer area. The blue area has separated sewers. I believe there's also a link in the RFP to the combined sewer map. So the sewer district has two basic categories of sewers in the service area. There are separated sewers and there are combined sewers. Within the separated system category, there are separate sanitary sewers and separate storm sewers. All three of these types can be found in the combined sewer area because many separate sewers flow into a combined sewer. The separated sewer system is the more modern of the sewer categories and is the type being installed today if you were going to build a subdivision or something. Uh, sanitary wastewater is transported to the wastewater treatment plant. For instance, they show a pipe coming out of the house here. It goes into its own sewer, which is supposed to be only sanitary sewer. Goes to an interceptor and then goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Stormwater, uh, for instance, here it's showing it going through catch basins in the street. It goes to a separate pipe that has gone directly to the environment. So that's a separated sewer system. The combined sewer system is an older method and the it transports the sanitary and the stormwater together in the same pipe, most of the time to the wastewater treatment plant. Larger precipitation events will cause combined sewer overflows. 
Uh, in this case, again, you see the laterals from the houses and industry and the catch basins in the street are all going into one shared pipe, which the preferred path is to the wastewater treatment plant. But there's a little weir in here, and sometimes when we get too much water in the system, it'll overflow that weir and it allows sanitary sewage to get to the environment instead of the plant. So when it starts raining, you would expect to see flow rates increase in a combined sewer system, of course, and in a separate sewer system. However, we also see flow rates increase in separate sanitary sewers. The source of this increased flow is a result of precipitation is, is called inflow and infiltration. And so on this graph, what we see is this bottom line, it starts to rain and you see the rain amount in uh, inches. And these upper rates show there's a monitor inside of a sanitary sewer and they're showing that the flow rates are reacting to this rainfall. So we know that rain, stormwater, melting snow also gets into these sanitary sewers. And if they're tributary to a combined sewer, they're in the combined sewer area. Um, so removing the stormwater from these separate sewers and combined sewers is the goal. And the important point is that the project demonstrates removal of stormwater from a combined sewer or separated sewer that is tributary to a combined sewer. So at the edge of the combined sewer area is often where we find separated sewers that are tributary to combined sewers. Uh, we'll look at a case here near the border with Euclid. Um, and here we, the border with Euclid is demonstrated by the separation between our combined area and this is Euclid service area over here. So at this location, um, you have these blue dashed lines are separated storm sewers. The green line is a sanitary sewer. So this area has a separated sewer. Um, and we can follow this flow path from here. This red circle is here. Uh, we can follow this all the way down. The storm sewers go to Euclid Creek. The sanitary sewers go to a combined sewer here on Lakeshore Boulevard. So this project was eligible because the storm sewers, despite the storm sewers being separate from the combined, the project still received a GI grant because it was able to prove a significant reduction of inflow and infiltration into the sanitary system, which is tributary to the combined sewer. And the picture here shows an example of that. Now, other locations here, this looks like the heart of the combined sewer system. But if we look closer, we see that in this area of the flats, we do have a separate system again. Here we are with a separate uh, sanitary sewers and separate storm sewers, which go right to the Cuyahoga River. So if we follow this flow path again, the storm sewers go right to the Cuyahoga River, and the sanitary flow goes to a combined sewer uh, closer to downtown. Now, in this case, the storm sewers are separate from the combined, and they discharge to the river, and the project was not eligible for a GI grant because it was not able to prove a significant reduction of the inflow and infiltration. So these two examples focused on areas of separated sewers. In most of the combined sewer area, you're, it's not going to be a difficult choice because it'll simply be going into a combined sewer. Uh, in addition to the location being very important, the project must quantifiably reduce the stormwater runoff volume to the combined sewer system. 
a project must demonstrate on-site stormwater control measures using green infrastructure. An applicant must represent a member community, a governmental entity, a nonprofit 501c3, or a business working in partnership with their com community. The applicant must be able to demonstrate permanent control of the project site. And the applicant and the property associated with the proposed project must be current and in good standing with all sewer district bills. Right. That concludes my section. I turn it over to Crystal Davis. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, everyone. Um, if someone would mind uh, watching the admittees while I'm in this portion of the presentation, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be going over, I'm sorry, my name is Crystal Davis, Watershed Program Specialist for the District, and I manage the administrative portions of the grant. Um, I'm going to be going over the evaluation criteria um, components of the, of the uh, proposal. Next slide. The first component is the expected benefits of the project, which is up to 30 points. Um, the applicant must be able to anticipate what the volume of stormwater runoff controlled will be and or removed from the system. So that's important that you'll be able to um, articulate that in writing. Um, next slide. The second component is project feasibility, uh, up to 25 points, uh, constructability and implementation, uh, demonstrated by either concept design, design plans, maps, and or stormwater calculations. And of course, within this portion, you'll also have to um, anticipate the completed uh, completion date of your project and the terms for the agreement is one year. Next slide. The third component is problematic capacity for applicants to maintain the project for design life expectancy. This is up to 25 points, so the applicant must be able to uh, have the ability to convey and can um, put in writing um, the ability to fund maintenance through the design life expectancy of the project. Next slide. And the fourth component is a visibility and additional community benefits, which is up to 20 points. Um, the applicant must be able to convey the project's further public understanding of the value of the GI components treated and or removed um, from the system. And then ultimately, once you've completed those four components, there is an extra uh, section for an additional 10 points to be achieved over and beyond the 100 points that you could potentially receive from those components if you have a design complete within the proposal at the time of submittal. Next slide. That concludes the portion of the evaluation criteria. I'm going to turn it over to Katie Wag, who's going to go into the contract components of the project. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Wag, and I am an assistant general counsel here at the district. Um, I'm going to be discussing the contracting process for entities whose projects are awarded for funding under the program. Um, and I'm going to touch on some of the key contractual provisions that you can expect to see in your contract if you are awarded under the program. Um, so once the district has received applications uh, for the green infrastructure projects and the district has made a determination as to which projects it's going to fund, um, the district board of trustees will um, vote on that project list and will adopt a resolution authorizing the district to enter into agreements which with each of those entities who have received awards. Um, so the practically the process 
will be that after our board has uh, approved that list of projects, um, I will prepare an agreement and email it to you um, for signature. Um, one thing to be aware of is that the project can commence after that agreement has been fully executed by both the grant recipient and the district, but um, do please do not um, perform any services, purchase any um, items that you're going to be seeking reimbursement for prior to having that fully executed agreement in place um, because we will not be able to reimburse you for that. Um, so just quickly by way of legal background, the district's authorized under Chapter 6119 of the Ohio Revised Code to make grants to any person or political subdivision for the acquisition of construction of water resource projects by such person or political subdivision. So that's our legal authority to have this program. Um, the agreement will obviously establish the not to exceed dollar amount for both uh, the project design and or the construction costs, and as well as the first year maintenance, unless it's a design only project where that's not applicable. Um, as I said before, grant funds will be provided on a reimbursement basis. Um, you won't be reimbursed for any work performed prior to the date of the fully executed agreement. So keep that in mind. Um, under the agreement terms, the grant recipients will be required to attend a mandatory green infrastructure operation and maintenance workshop, which will be provided by the district. And we'll set forth the O&M guidelines for green infrastructure practices that the grant recipient will be required to perform once the project is completed. Um, the grant recipient will be required to obtain district approvals related to the design and construction documents at various stages and milestones of the project. It will also establish the uh, the contract will establish the project schedule and will set forth a schedule of quarterly progress reports that will need to be submitted to the district. Um, the district will have the right to access the premises on which the projects are constructed to inspect the projects for the design life expectancy of the projects. Um, Crystal touched on this term, um, but design life expectancy is defined in the contract as as long as the project is operational with reasonable ongoing maintenance. Um, the, the agreement also sets out some prohibitions on transferring the property on which the project is located during the design life expectancy of the project. So um, grant recipients must either retain a property interest in the project to remain responsible for the requirements, including ongoing maintenance, or have an agreement with the new owner that that new owner is going to take over the obligations under this, the agreement. Um, or if possible, in rare cases, um, relocate the project to another location. Um, one of the most important takeaways from this is um, that I want you to have is before you submit your project application to the district, have your attorney review the agreement template that will be provided with the all of the grant application information. Um, so that there aren't any surprises um, for you. The project doesn't get delayed because we're trying to work through um, the agreement. Um, just make sure that that agreement is something that you feel you're going to be able to sign um, as is before you submit your application. Um, so at this point, I think we're going to pause and take any questions that anyone may have up to this point. And Katie, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, so. OK. Looks like we're we're good to continue. All right, thank you very much. OK, at this point, we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break.
We'll give the opportunity for others that are trying to join uh, to be able to do so. So we will literally uh, step away for uh, 10 minutes and we'll be back at, it looks like 9.37. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. Um, we're coming off of a 10 minute break. We've given an opportunity for others to join. I believe they have. We're going to turn it over to Chris Hartman, who's going to go over the technical requirements for the proposal. Chris. Thank you, Crystal. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Crystal mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Hartman. I'm the stormwater technical specialist for the district and uh, kind of oversee the uh, technical requirements for the green infrastructure grants program. So the, the two th key things that we're gonna be talking about today uh, relate to um, our code requirement, which we've re referred to as Title IV and how uh, the grant impacts uh, or how that impacts your grant application, as well as the stormwater calculator, the US EPA's uh, stormwater calculator uh, which is a tool that we require be used as part of your application process. Uh, so those are going to be covered in detail here. So uh, to get things started, uh, talking about Title IV, uh, any of our applicants for our grant are subject to the requirements of our Title IV code. 
Um, and there's a lovely document that we refer to as the submittal requirements for connections to the combined sewer system uh, that has all the details in it. Uh, but we're going to be kind of uh, giving you the basics of what that says, uh, kind of put it in layman's terms for you, and uh, hope that you'll have a really good understanding of what that's all about. So earlier, uh, Rob kind of touched base on uh, what it means to be in a combined sewer system. Uh, I'm going to dive into that a little bit deeper uh, and kind of break it down for you so you have a complete understanding of that. Uh, so the first thing we're going to look at is uh, what the makeup of a combined sewer system landscape is. And it's pretty simple. Uh, really, it's a combination of neighborhoods, uh, homes, and businesses. Uh, and the businesses often incorporate, obviously, industrial facilities as well. So uh, there are certainly open space areas as well, uh, parks, recreation areas uh, that are part of this system uh, that make up the landscape. Uh, but we're focused on the impervious areas uh, for the purposes of this grant. So next comes uh, the contributions of water uh, and liquids, if you will, to the combined sewer system. So first, uh, from the homes, uh, we have a lot of domestic wastewater, of course. Uh, anything that gets flushed on the toilet, anything that your dishwasher uses, bathtubs, laundry, all of those things uh, are making it down into the combined sewer system um, that we're talking about. The uh, next source of, of, of water is obviously our drainage system for stormwater. Uh, that is tied directly uh, into the combined sewer system, or as Rob described, it can be a separate pipe that eventually makes its way to the combined sewer system. And then, of course, uh, industrial facilities contribute uh, effluent as well, uh, whether it's part of their processes uh, for making the products they make or whether it's uh, the cleaning of materials and floors like the picture shows. Uh, all of that makes it to the system as well. So the next image is um, the infrastructure of the combined sewer system itself. What is it made of? What are the pieces, parts? So I like to think of the pipes like a tree, okay? Uh, we have small pipes, which are the branches, <clears throat> and we have large pipes, which are the trunks of the tree. Uh, generally speaking, the smaller pipes are owned and operated by the local community, uh, primarily the city of Cleveland and, and the, and the uh, smaller areas outside of the city of Cleveland that fringe it. Uh, but the larger pipes, what we call the interceptor sewers, are owned and operated by the sewer district, and those are the ones that convey the flow to the wastewater treatment plants. So within the system, uh, and Rob touched on this as well, uh, we have regulators, and the regulators are where the magic happens of where the water goes. Uh, we're gonna, as soon as we're done with these slides right here, we're gonna take a closer look at that image you see of that regulator with that uh, weir wall that's in the middle of it. Just know that they are part of the system. Uh, when the regulators activate, meaning when water goes over them, uh, that water discharges to the environment. Uh, and there's a photo of one of the combined sewer overflows uh, during a, a heavy rain event, and that's what it looks like. And then, of course, uh, the goal is to get as much water as we can to the wastewater treatment plants for proper treatment. Uh, and that's always what's happening during low flow or dry day conditions. So here's that beautiful picture of that regulator up close and personal. Uh, you can see there's two elevations of pipes here. Uh, I'm going to pull up a pointer here. So we have a higher elevation here and you can see the flow going through it. Uh, that's what goes to the wastewater treatment plant on a dry day. And then here we have our weir. Uh, and when this fills up, it spills over to the second pipe, which discharges to the environment. But Let's show you that how that works. So during dry weather, uh, when day like today, when it's, there's no rain falling, uh, primarily we're seeing sanitary flow pass through the system and go right to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, there is additional capacity uh, to handle a uh, light rain events, and those would all go to the combined or to the uh, wastewater treatment plant as well. But it's when we get the heavy rain events. Um, 
the frog chokers is what I like to call them. They uh, spill over the weir and go down to that second pipe. And that second pipe, uh, like I mentioned before, is what goes to the wastewater treatment plants. I'm sorry, the second pipe is what goes to the combined sewer overflows and uh, to, the, uh, to the environment. Uh, again, there's that picture showing uh, that happening. This conveys a lot of trash to uh, the environment. Uh, you'll notice that when there are warnings for ba high bacteria levels in Lake Erie, they generally happen right after a heavy rain event uh, because we experience some overflow events in our system, which it's designed to do. But the goal is to, through this grant program, is to help alleviate that problem, of course. So let's look at um, how this looks on our maps, okay? So I want to point out several features. If you have the opportunity to see our maps and how we represent everything, um, this is what you'll see. So these yellow pipes are the local uh, pipes, the local combined sewer pipes, and those are the branches of the tree I mentioned earlier. Uh, the purple pipes are uh, the ones, the interceptors that we own and operate. Those are the tree trunks, if you will, uh, that I showed in that picture. The regulators are represented by these green boxes, and although this is kind of a grainy picture, they each have an identifier uh, with them, um, but uh, that's uh, where the water is uh, determined where it goes. Uh, does it go to the wastewater treatment plant only, or is it a high enough flow rate where it actually spills over the weir and goes to this pink pipe, which are the combined sewer overflow pipe? And you can see that that discharges right into Lake Erie uh, at this location. Of course, uh, some of the other colors in these maps, um, separate sanitary lines are, are indicated by green, and you can see that those tie into that regulator and eventually go into our um, interceptor to the wastewater treatment plant. And there's a little blue uh, dashed line up here. Uh, Rob touched on this as well. Uh, those represent any separate storm sewers uh, that are located in the system. And again, uh, many of those tie into the combined sewer system. Um, along the shoreline, they may just discharge right into Lake Erie. Okay. All right, so what does it mean when we say uh, the grant wants you to go above and beyond our Title IV requirements? Title IV basically gives us the authority to control the rate of flow that goes into the combined sewer system um, and, and to any pipes that tie, um, uh, whether they're owned locally or whether it's our uh, interceptor pipes that we own directly. So we're controlling peak flow. Uh, we do that at the point where connections are made to those pipes. So if you're building uh, a new development, you may have one or two connection points to the pipes. Uh, that's what we're looking at. And um, there, it's applicable to any development activity in that combined sewer area. Again, I mentioned uh, that there are separate sewers that tie back into or, or are tributary to the combined sewer system. Uh, those areas are, uh, we look at those as well. So the minimum standard can generally be uh, honed down to this slide. Basically, you can't uh, improve a property and discharge the water at a faster rate, uh, the storm water at a faster rate than what it was discharging before you developed the property. So your post-development peak flows cannot exceed your existing condition peak flows. And the existing condition is often questioned uh, because there are scenarios where Properties have been uh, demoed or the existing buildings and pavement have been removed. Um, but generally speaking, uh, with some exceptions, the existing condition is whatever the current land use is at the time that you will make application uh, for the GI grant. OK, so when does Title IV actually come into play? When do you need to worry about it as, as an applicant for the GI grant? So the first question to ask, uh, does your project result in at least a half acre of disturbed ground? If it does not, 
then compliance with Title IV is not required. Uh, Title IV compliance, uh, with a very few exceptions, it only comes into play if you are proposing a disturbance of a half acre or greater. If that acreage is met or exceeded, uh, the next question to ask is whether or not your proposed improvements result in a net increase of impervious area of rooftops of parking lots. Uh, another way to look at that is the existing vegetated area being decreased. Um, <clears throat> and are, is that area draining to one of our regulators? So, and if the answer to that is no, if you're not uh, increasing peak rate flow, then technically by default, you are in compliance with Title IV already uh, because you're not worsening the amount and rate of stormwater coming off of that property. However, if there is an increase in that flow, uh, that's when Title IV kicks in and that's when you start to need to find ways to manage that water uh, so that it has no negative impact to downstream uh, systems. So how, how do we actually manage the peak flow? Um, so we're going to look at a very general scenario. Um, you know, this isn't meant to be a detailed look at how this works. Uh, it's kind of the layman's terms of how uh, peak rate flow uh, is managed. Uh, so let's take a look at a generic site um, with the existing conditions, the pre-development conditions being undeveloped. The whole site is just grass at this point. Um, the one year 24 hour storm um, is 1.95 inches of rainfall. OK, so keep that in mind. And let's just generally say when we get that kind of storm event on this grassy undeveloped area, um, it results in a runoff of volume of 3000 cubic feet. Um, and it takes 12 hours for that runoff of volume to discharge which equates to 0.07 cubic feet per second. That's just the units that we typically use when we talk about peak rate discharge. So the proposed conditions or the post development conditions change the land use. Um, now that grassy area is 100% impervious. It's all rooftop, it's all parking lot. Uh, the one year storm still is 1.95 inches, regardless if you're talking pre-development, post-development. But now, because we've removed vegetation and added impervious area, we get a lot more runoff and it runs off a lot faster as well. So uh, that what used to be 3000 cubic feet of runoff is now ballooned to 7000 cubic feet of runoff. And it takes um, <clears throat> and it can be it can't be discharged any faster than what was there before the 0.07 cubic feet per second. So in order to accomplish that, it's going to take 28 hours to manage that water, uh, to get that water off the site. And that's where your, uh, your post peak rate discharge needs to be less than your pre peak rate discharge. So you're going to need um, detention. You're going to need a way to store that volume of water and release it slowly. And that's where detention practices come into play. One thing to keep in mind here in this scenario, because we're going to come back to this in a little bit, the total volume that has been discharged from this, this scenario is 7,000 cubic feet. We didn't manage volume at all. All we have managed is the rate of release of that extra water. Keep that in mind. Okay, so do you need to comply with Title IV? A couple uh, scenarios here that we see kind of represent what we see on a typical basis. So this particular view of this property, let's just say that existing conditions, there's 1.58 acres of developed land, and there's an additional 1.75 acres that's not developed, generally speaking. If you add a parking lot in that back area, do you need to comply with Title IV? And the answer is yes. This is the most obvious um, scenario where you have increased the impervious area, you have decreased the vegetated area, so you should expect there to be more runoff and that needs to be managed. Uh, so the parking lot in this scenario would uh, result in the need to comply with Title IV. So let's change things up just a bit. 
same existing conditions, but what if we're adding a green infrastructure practice in the back? What if that parking lot is not asphalt, but it's permeable pavers? Do you need to comply with Title IV? And the answer is yes, you still need to comply with Title IV. You have changed the surface of that property. You have made gone from vegetation to something that's not vegetation. Uh, so there will be an increase of runoff generated. Now, maybe you have really good soils underneath and you can soak it all in under the permeable papers. Maybe you can't. That's you know a very site-specific question that needs to be answered. But the point of this is saying um, Title IV compliance must be demonstrated before uh, we can say uh, that you are going, going above and beyond Title IV with that permeable paver practice. All right, so taking a different look at the same property, you know, the same pre existing conditions. What if we're only converting the existing parking lot into, or I should say, from traditional asphalt into permeable pavers? Do you need to comply with Title IV? The answer is no in this case. You're not increasing the impervious area, you're simply converting it to another. Uh, type of uh, stormwater control measure. Uh, so uh, in this particular scenario, uh, there's there's no net increase in impervious area, so you would not expect there to be an increase in uh, peak rate runoff. So therefore, by default, again, you do not uh, you already comply with Title IV requirements. Okay. So there's some nuances out there that we want to make sure you're aware of. Um, most sites have one discharge point and uh, discharge to one regulator. Uh, those the regulators again are the things with that weir in the middle of that, that image we showed you before. But sometimes a site discharges to two different regulators and uh, you want to be aware of the when this happens, what needs to be considered. OK, so again, here's an actual scenario with our maps uh, showing the drainage patterns. Let's just say that 75% of this particular site drains to the combined sewer on King Avenue, and it goes to that regulator uh, that's circled in red. OK, and this is existing conditions. And let's just say that that the peak rate discharge that was calculated for that area is 2.0 cubic feet per second. Well, there's still the, the other side of the site, the additional 25% of the site that discharges to the combined sewer area under Lakeside Avenue and goes to a different regulator. That particular uh, peak rate discharge for that portion of the site is calculated at 0.5 CFS. So the entire site combined, generally speaking, uh, has a discharge rate of 2.5 cubic feet per, per second, just by adding those two together. But if you go in there and develop this property and you propose to take all the drainage to uh, King Avenue, so none of it goes to Lakeside Avenue sewer any longer, uh, you're taking it to one regulator where it was split between two regulators before. Uh, the developed peak rate discharge, or the when you improve that property, you cannot exceed the peak rate discharge to that particular regulator uh, of 2.0 cubic feet per second. Even though the site was 2.5 cubic feet per second, you're now limiting it to one regulator, and that one regulator only accepted two cubic feet per second. So that's that's the standard you would be held to in order to discharge the full site that direction. So that's what happens when there's two regulators that come into play and you have split drainage to those. It doesn't happen. It, it happens less than one regulator, of course, uh, but this scenario does come into play occasionally. Uh, and we, we can help walk you through that uh, and explain that to you uh, if you have questions on that as you're developing your application. OK, um, so what does green infrastructure accomplish uh, that goes above and beyond Title IV? Now we're talking about volume reduction. 
Before we were talking about controlling the rate of release. Now we're controlling the volume of release of the water. And this is the magic of green infrastructure. So again, taking a look at that same scenario I laid out, an undeveloped piece of property, one year storm, we got 3000 cubic feet runoff, and we have a, a discharge rate over 12 hours of 0 0.07 cubic feet per second. The proposed conditions, again, 100% impervious developed, same storm event, but now um, we had that additional 4,000 cubic feet of runoff. Green infrastructure addresses that, that volume of runoff. There's a total volume discharged um, with the previous scenario that was 7,000 cubic feet. The goal of green infrastructure is to uh, discharge something less than 7,000 cubic feet, okay? Uh, the ultimate goal would be to uh, only discharge what was discharged prior to the development and have a, a no net impact to the combined sewers uh, downstream. So that's what we're trying to accomplish with the green infrastructure grant is to reduce that that volume that was generated by improving that property or in the case of a retrofit, uh, reducing the volume that's already discharging from the site. And here's kind of a summary of uh, those two scenarios. Um, if you're using um, peak rate control versus green infrastructure, you know, your pre-development runoff volume discharge didn't change. You know, you're starting with the same site. Your total runoff volume generated uh, is the same, but the difference now is what is what leaves the site overall? What is discharged from the site? Uh, again, meeting Title IV requirements, you're still discharging all of that water. You're just controlling the release rate. Uh, the post-development uh, scenario for runoff volume discharge for green infrastructure is again, something ideally um, the same amount that was released in the existing conditions but something less than the 7,000 cubic feet. Okay. So let's move to discussing uh, what project costs will the grant cover? Uh, so the first question to ask yourself is, does your project result in an increase in impervious area? And in other words, um, are you gonna have to meet Title IV requirements or not? just by what you're proposing to do. If it doesn't uh, have a net increase in uh, impervious area, um, the grants program will cover essentially all of the costs associated with the improvements you're, pro you're um, proposing uh, with your GI grant application. If the, there is an increase in impervious area, uh, first what you must do is determine what your construction costs would be to simply comply with the minimum standards of Title IV. Okay, we'll call that um, a cost A, if you will. Then your next step would be to determine your construction costs to implement the green infrastructure practices to achieve volume reduction. Typically, that'll be a higher cost than meeting the, t the minimum standards for Title IV. Uh, so the grant in this case would cover the costs of that difference. Um, step two minus step one costs. So that's generally what is eligible for the grant to cover. Uh, so keep that in mind for your uh, application. Uh, keep it in mind. Consider that during your application process. If you um, are proposing to disconnect stormwater runoff from the combined sewer system, and alternatively uh, take it to the environment or take it to one of those pink pipes which eventually make it to the environment. Um, there's things you need to think about here. That's a slightly different scenario. We call this offloading, uh, where you're taking water that used to go to the combined sewer system but is no longer going to be going to the combined sewer system. We are in favor of this. Um, and uh, what our Title IV code requires is that uh, with the assumption that that water used to go to the treatment plant and get treated for the most part, 
we can't simply let it go to the environment without it being treated somehow, some way. Um, so the state of Ohio has what they call this uh, water quality volume. We require for our Title IV code for you to um, take that drainage area and route it through a stormwater control measure that treats the water quality volume, a calculated amount, um, before you discharge it to the environment. The key thing here is that not all stormwater control measures that do this are considered green infrastructure. Uh, so um, if you do this and you provide a green infrastructure component to it, um, some of the, those costs may be reimbursable by the grant. You may be eligible for the grant. OK, um, so let's dive into that just a little deeper. Um, oh, I mentioned that it, the SCMs don't necessarily need to be green infrastructure. Um, and that that, for, that difference in cost is what is eligible for the grant. And here is kind of a scenario, a uh, very generic scenario that I lay out. Um, the red star-shaped polygon, let's just assume that that's impervious area um, that is directed to the uh, pipe system that ties into the combined sewer system, okay? So the existing conditions, the existing discharge goes to the green pipe in this case. Uh, if the improvement is simply to no longer take it that way, but take it to the combined sewer overflow pipe, um, which eventually goes to the environment, you have offloaded that red area from the combined sewer area. Um, but um, you need to install a water quality volume control measure before you discharge it to that pipe. And again, uh, that control measure can be green infrastructure, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, we'll have time for questions later uh, when we uh, get to the end of the technical side of things, but uh, certainly ask them if you have them about that scenario. Okay, hey Chris, so this is, yes. Chris, I'm gonna pause you just for a second because there is a question in the chat that that talk, that was directed towards your last couple of slides. So I just thought it might be a good time to reiterate. So the, the question was, uh, is the district evaluating uh, the gr the grant applications based only on water quanti quantity, or is the district also considering water quality? And I think you just explained that. So maybe just to, to reiterate in a summary, when water quality applies. Yeah, well, it's it's primarily primarily a water quality volume. I'm sorry, a water. Let me try that again. <laughs> it's a volume uh, reduction that we're trying to achieve if you're discharging to the combined sewer pipe system. OK, uh, it's more of a quality issue um, when you're discharging to the pink pipe or the combined sewer overflow pipes or directly to the environment. Uh, certainly, uh, we hope to achieve volume reduction in that latter scenario as well. Uh, but again, different green infrastructure practices perform different functions. It really all depends on the function of the practice that you want to put in. Uh, certainly going to score more points. They're going to have more effective, uh, more effect on the overall environment if you treat the quality and the quantity at any given time. Uh, but certainly we are going to consider either scenario when you're discharging directly to the environment. Does that make sense? Did I get that I capture that map? You did. I'm okay. just going to add a little bit more in the chat. Sure. OK, thank Great. you. Thanks. OK, so uh, where do you find this information on our website? Uh, if you go to our website and go to the business tab and the there's a plan review uh, link under the business tab, if you go to that, uh, you can then uh, it'll be, then be taken to our plan review page. <clears throat> When you scroll down that page, you'll see the, the nice map that Rob showed you earlier, uh, which kind of shows where the combined sewer area service area is versus the separate sewer area is. Uh, and you can zoom in and out and find your property that way. Um, and then there under the map is the link to our submittal requirements uh, for tying or discharging to our uh, combined sewer pipes. So. OK, 
Uh, and that's what that document looks like right there. Uh, the, the submittal requirements document. I think it's only like 14 pages long and a lot of its appendices, so it's it's not overwhelming by any means. OK, so moving on to away from Title IV implications to the stormwater calculator and what the stormwater calculator is all about. This is a tool that you'll be expected to use to um, provide us uh, a way to assess the impacts and the benefits of your proposal for green infrastructure. Um, this particular view uh, is from uh, the, the desktop version. You can either uh, download a desktop version or you can use the web version. Uh, this is what you'll see if you use the desktop version. If you use the web version, you'll start at this point um, by Googling that. So if you just Google stormwater calculator, uh, it pops right up. Uh, I'm going to use the view. OK, I'm sorry. This again is the uh, web view uh, you'll see. And I, what I want to point out on the on the left hand side here, um, it looks a little different. These are the tabs for all the different modules that we're going to be talking about in the web view. Um, but if you use the desktop view, which is the uh, what I'm going to be showing you images of, uh, you'll see how that changes just a bit. So quickly, let's go over uh, the different types of green infrastructure that are taken into account in the stormwater calculator. Uh, disconnection is an option uh, as a green infrastructure practice, and this is simply uh, taking runoff from existing and previous areas and diverting it into vegetated areas. Uh, we don't see a lot of this as far as our grant application, um, but it certainly is something that the calculator can uh, give you results on if that's what you choose to do. Heart rainwater harvesting systems include uh, cisterns, rain barrels, and the like. Rain gardens are smaller infiltration practices that handle small impervious drainage areas. A lot of times you'll see these uh, on small uh, commercial buildings or individual homes. Um, they are a cousin to bioretention cells, but they are a different practice than bioretention cells. Green roof systems kind of speak for themselves, vegetating the rooftops of the buildings. Uh, street planters are, uh, for the most part, bioretention cells in a more confined area. Um, the space is limited, so uh, street planners behave like bioretention, but they take up less of a footprint. And, and as I'll mention later as well, uh, if you're proposing bioretention practices, uh, you'll be using the street planner module uh, to uh, figure out what your results are and your benefits are. Infiltration basins are pretty self-explanatory, routing runoff to a uh, a pit in the ground, if you will, uh, that can absorb that water. And the last one is permeable pavement, which is one of the most popular uh, practices we see uh, on our applications. OK, so we're going to go over each module so you understand how to navigate through this. Uh, again, this is the desktop view. Um, these tabs are images on the left side of the web view, uh, but they are uh, in the same order and perform the same. So the first thing you would need to do is tell the calculator where you are, and uh, you can either enter an address and it'll take you right to it, or you can zoom in and um, just uh, click on the uh, location of your practice. Um, and it, it, it defaults to uh, recent aerial photos where you'll be able to easily find where you are. Once you know your location, um, in this example, we used the uh, Watershed Stewardship Center in Parma uh, as our sample location of how this works. It'll keep you there and you'll go to the second tab and determine what your soil type is. Now, uh, the soil type is broken down into what they call the hydrologic soil groups, uh, A, B, C, or D. Um, the earlier you are in the alphabet, the more water that soaks into the ground, we'll say. 
Um, but the view here is what you want to pay attention to. If the soils information is available on the calculator, it'll look uh, like this image. It'll it'll draw that out. And you can see here uh, the purple represents the D soils, the hydrologic soil group D, which has high runoff potential. It's primarily a clay soil, as so you're going to get a lot of runoff. Um, but knowing what soil type predominates your site uh, is one of the inputs uh, that you need to determine. And again, uh, A, B, C, and D are your options. A are sandy soils, D are clay soils, um, and uh, you'll just have to pick the right one that fits your site. Keep in mind that if you find that you have what's called an urban soil or a eudorthant, is what they call it, which is a great Scrabble word if anybody likes Scrabble. Those would default to a, a group D uh, unless you have some information specific to your site that indicates otherwise. Um, the soil maps are very general. Uh, they're not site specific. They're not designed to be site specific design information, um, but uh, that way uh, if you do have some site specific information that you've uh, invested in getting, uh, certainly uh, if it contradicts what the maps show, uh, provide that to us as supporting information in your application. Now, what if you have no clue what your soil type is? Well, there's a way to find out what if you're an A, B, C, or D soil. Uh, the Web Soil Survey is a tool you can go to, um, and if you just Google Web Soil Survey, it'll take you to this screen here. Um, you will have a chance to uh, zoom in on your property. Um, again, uh, with the tools that are available on that website. And uh, once you find that property, and here I've done that uh, for the Watershed Stewardship, Watershed Stewardship Center, um, you'll identify your area of interest uh, and draw a box around what you're interested in knowing this, what the soils are. Uh, you will then, you see these tabs, let me pull my pointer up here. You see all these tabs up top here. This is follow along as I proceed through these slides. You'll see how these change, um, but the area of interest is where you define um, this box. All right, so the next once you do that, uh, if you go to the next tab, which is the soil map, it'll spit you out a table on the left hand side there that tells you what soil map units uh, fall within that area of interest. So now you know what soils you have that you're dealing with. You go to the next tab of Soil Data Explorer, which brings up additional tabs. <laughs> but if you go to the Soil Properties and Qualities tab on that one, uh, you'll see here, okay, here's our Soil Data Explorer. Here's our Soil Properties tab. You'll see here, you can select the hydrologic soil group summary for those soils on your area of interest. And what that will do is provide you this table at the bottom of your screen, and you can see under the column that says rating, uh, that's your hydrologic soil group for those soils. So now we know that these soils on our area of interest are predominantly D soils. Now we know what to input into the stormwater calculator. Okay, so moving along, uh, the next tab in the calculator is soil drainage. The uh, once you know whether your soil is A, B, C, or D, this is pretty easy to figure out. Uh, if you have an A soil, you have high infiltration, use the default value of one inch per hour, and you can progress through. If you have a D soil, uh, you would select uh, the value of uh, 0.01 inches per hour of infiltration. So use those soil group values, A, B, C, or D, to dictate what your value is as far as the uh, how fast your site drains. If you have site-specific information, certainly use that as well. Maybe you've done some infiltration testing already. And we want to point out one thing that uh, we're paying closer attention to is our infiltration rates, OK? Um, we need specific information for your site, and you have a couple options. Uh, you can certainly do infiltration testing 
during the application phase, if you so choose. There's a cost, obviously, that you would have to invest in, in finding out what that is. Um, or uh, you can do that during the design phase when you get into full design. Uh, and worse, or at least at a minimum, you would want to do it uh, at the time uh, that you are constructing the project to verify um, the assumed infiltration rates are reasonably being met. Uh, so there are processes in place that we want every applicant to follow as far as doing infiltration testing. Uh, the Ohio Rainwater and Land Development Manual is the best source of information. They lay out uh, how to go about doing this. Uh, other state manuals certainly have their methods to do this, and uh, if you use another state manual, uh, please talk to us and make sure that we're comfortable with it. Um, and certainly if you have something unusual that deviates from any standard um, that you want to try, uh, we would certainly consider that on a case-by-case -case basis as well. The key thing is here, if you're relying on infiltration to meet Title IV or exceed Title IV requirements, we have to have a level of confidence that your soils uh, will actually do that. OK, topography is the next tab in or next module in the model. Uh, again, this information may be available uh, on the data that's in the model itself. Uh, if it's not, uh, you're just going to have to do your best estimate of, of those four categories, uh, what they uh, what best fits your site. Uh, so for our particular site, the yellow area did actually was uh, determined on the calculator. So we used a uh, value of moderately steep. Precipitation uh, data is default data. Uh, when you input your location, it automatically pulls in the data from the closest uh, rain gauges that are available in that area. Uh, so you don't have to do anything here other than select the appropriate rain gauge uh, that it automatically defaults to anyway. Same with the evaporation module as well. Uh, just utilize whatever it defaults to for the most part. Uh, there's a climate change tab. Uh, we're not considering climate change when we want you to do these uh, number crunchings for the applications, so select the no change option for climate change. Um, and then moving on to land cover module. Uh, this is where the magic begins in the modules or in the in the calculator. Uh, the land cover is where you'll be manipulating your percent land covers over from pre and post development conditions. Uh, we're going to tie and we're going to look at that closer in a minute. And then the lid controls, the low impact development controls i.e. the green infrastructure practices. Uh, this is where you would input the data uh, for that information as well in your proposed scenarios. <clears throat> Make sure uh, the design storm for sizing uh, data input uh, says zero as well. I, I don't think it really has an impact, but just for consistency from application to application, we want that to be set at zero. Uh, and we are not going to be considering any of the cost estimation variables uh, involved with this module. It does offer that alt, um, that option, but we do not consider those numbers when we are looking at uh, the results that you're providing. We're simply looking at this as a tool to determine volume benefits. And then there's a results page uh, or our module uh, that will spit out the information uh, that we're looking for for you to provide us in the grant application. So when you're filling out the results, uh, module information, uh, set your years to analyze at 20 and your event threshold at uh, a tenth of an inch. Uh, again, just for consistency purposes from each application. Okay, so we're gonna walk through real quick uh, how we input actual data for a particular site. We're going to be actually looking at uh, the sewer district's uh, GJM building on Euclid Avenue and East 40th as our sample location. All right, so we picked our location. We, we, we put our dot on top of our building. We know exactly where we are. Uh, and we move to the soil type tab. And you can see nothing populates on as far as colors on the screen. 
Uh, so that data is not available through the calculator for this particular site. Um, I know for a fact that it's an urban soil. <laughs> it's obviously been well developed, uh, so it is unnatural, if you will, anymore. So it should be considered urban and uh, it should be considered, let me go back there real quick, should be considered a D soil, which I selected in this case. The soil drainage defaults then to the worst case scenario for infiltration. So I use the 0.01 inches per hour as my input. Topography we know is pretty much flat. So we're less than a 2% slope. So we picked the flat um, option. It defaulted to a particular uh, rain gauges and whatnot near us. Same with evaporation, it defaulted right to the one we need. We did not consider climate change input at all. But here is where we start working and seeing the differences. So I made some assumptions just to show you how this works. Uh, started with a existing conditions that may have been here before the sewer district built this building. Uh, the site may have been 40% forest, 20% meadow, 25% lawn, which leaves a balance of 15% impervious. Okay, maybe there was a home here with a nice landscaped property, who knows? Um, but uh, that's what we started with. The lid controls, the low impact development controls, well, we haven't put any on yet. We want to know what the runoff was before the site was developed. And the results uh, show you a couple key numbers here I want to point out. Um, every one of these scenarios, you're going to see an average annual rainfall of 36.71 inches. That won't change. That's just dictated by the climate. What is going to change is the average annual runoff as we change these numbers a little bit. So before we do anything, we only have about a third of the rainfall that hits the ground actually running off in an average year. All right, so let's change things up a little bit. Let's change our land cover to what it generally is today. Um, we're about 90% impervious and only 10% lawn. That's all we have on this property at this point. So what does that do to our runoff scenarios? We still have no uh, green infrastructure that we've implemented at this point. And you can see that the average annual runoff more than doubled. It's now up to 28 inches of runoff um, of that 36, almost 37 total. So we, we, we increased runoff considerably over an average year. So let's mitigate that. Let's uh, take our 90% impervious site and let's add <clears throat> some lid controls. Let's take 75% of our impervious area and route it to some street planters that are properly designed. What does that do? You can see uh, I used my existing conditions, my 90% impervious as my baseline scenario. So you can see that it went from 28 inches of runoff to less than 23 inches of runoff by implementing that, uh, those street planters. What if we put more than one green infrastructure practice in place? Say 25% of our site, we harvest the rainfall from the roof and we use it for washing our vehicles perhaps. Uh, maybe 25% of the roof, we convert to green roof. Uh, maybe 50% of the site goes to street planters now. So we've routed, 100% of our impervious area to something that uh, is green infrastructure. And you can see those numbers there. So what does that result in? We've been able to drop that number even further from a worst case scenario of 20, 28 inches to um, roughly 17 inches of runoff uh, per year. And this slide kind of summarizes all those results. Um, the upper left is um, is uh, the existing conditions before we uh, have any development on it. So we started with 13 inches. We created a lot of runoff, and then we uh, implemented different scenarios of green infrastructure and kind of closed that gap. That's how the model works. Uh, so those last two modules that do most of the work for you. So I've mentioned the term baseline scenario before. 
in the, when you use the model, you're going to have to define a baseline scenario. And as you walk through it, it, it explains how you do that. Um, if you are not increasing your impervious area on your proposed project, you will use your existing conditions results as your baseline scenario. If you're adding impervious area, uh, you're going to want to um, use the uh, the design that meets our minimum Title IV requirements as your baseline scenario, because that's what you're going to be comparing your results with uh, as far as when you start to run the model for implementing green infrastructure. Some helpful hints uh, that we've learned along the way with this model. Uh, treatment trains, when you're routing practice green infrastructure practice A into green infrastructure practice B, the calculator isn't designed to handle that. <laughs> so you got to do a, a little work on your end to figure out how to use that, how to make it work. One option is to use a different model, um, the stormwater management model, uh, which the calculator is based off of. Uh, but that's when you're getting into the intricacies of uh, data input um, and you would typically typically need to work with a uh, design engineer to to use that model to get your answers uh, we suggest you be a little creative and simply justify your assumptions and by being creative uh, we've talked to the us epa uh, about their model and we came up with this example uh, to to show you what you could do so let's just say we have a, a particular site that has 15,000 square feet of roof, uh, of, of green roof that discharges to permeable pavement. Okay, I, let me try that again. We have a total of 15,000 square feet of roof um, uh, that we are converting to green, uh, which then will discharge the permeable pavement. Uh, step one for you to figure out how this treatment train benefits you is to run the model only considering the green roof and its drainage area specific to the green roof. So let's again hypothetically say that by doing so, um, you you reduce runoff by 45% from the roof only. So you can assume that 55% of the green roof still behaves as traditional roof surface. All right, and the numbers are there to kind of lay that out. You would then run the model for just the permeable pavement, the second car of the train, and take into consideration its drainage area, but also take into account the additional 55% of the roof area uh, that is still running off and routing that into the um, permeable pavement as well. Whatever results from that second run of the permeable pavement is the result, is the benefit that you would show us. All right. All right, some things to consider here. Uh, the a couple of the infiltration practices don't take into account uh, the fact that stormwater control measures typically have under drains. Um, as a sewer district and as the state of Ohio recommends, any infiltration practice that you have, we always recommend you have under drains in case something goes awry <laughs> that you can't remedy easily. Uh, it gives a way for the water to get off, get out of your practice uh, and not cause damage to anything. So we just want you to understand that even though the calculator says under drains aren't considered, um, if your design includes them, which we want them to, that's not going to count against you as far as any calculations that we look at. Um, we do ask you uh, when you do put under drains in that you consider designing them in a way that will uh, increase infiltration potential. And by this, we mean uh, this general setup right here. The What you're looking at here is a drawing of uh, this type of scenario. Uh, this is a cross section that we, if you just sliced this picture down the middle, and looked at it sideways, this is what you would see. OK, so we have our catch basin uh, represented here. 
uh, which is our concrete outside box of this particular image. And we have a permeable paver set up uh, that drains through all the different stone layers. And you can see that there's an under drain pipe right through here. But there are two discharge elevations. Um, the pipe can discharge here, or it can discharge through a higher elevation up here. Um, if it discharges at the lower elevation, any water that sits in this system below the red dot on the screen has a potential to infiltrate um, between storm events. But if we raise that elevation by putting it up here, obviously we have more volume of water stored in the system that has the potential to infiltrate. Uh, so we get a greater potential benefit from that. Now we have recognized the, that unforeseen circumstances come up, unforeseen problems happen. Uh, so to a uh, way to implement this and easily remedy it if a problem ha happens that's caused by this higher elevation, um, the lower elevation is capped. And uh, you can see the rubber cap on the lower elevation here. Uh, removing that cap simply now lowers that discharge elevation back to what would be typical. So um, if you see a problem, it's a super easy fix uh, to uh, remedy it. Um, and we've seen a few of our sites uh, utilize this design and it seems to have worked out well. I don't even think we've had anybody have to take that cap off at this point. Okay, so that under drains are covered there. Uh, if you have a unique control practice that doesn't really fit any of the things in the model, um, certainly uh, you can uh, be creative. Uh, use your best professional judgment to make it fit. Again, we want everybody to use this model uh, so we can compare results equally. Um, if you have questions on well, what do I use, uh, certainly we can answer those questions for you as you're going through your process. Uh, some other things to consider in the land cover module, uh, the footprints of rain gardens, street planters, and infiltration basins should be counted towards meadow or lawn. Okay, so as far as your percentages that you enter there. Um, and the footprints of permeable pavement systems and green roofs should be counted as impervious uh, services um, in this particular uh, land cover module. And we have verified this with the US EPA and they agree with how we make these interpretations. And then in the lid controls module, uh, if you're proposing bioretention cells and infiltration trenches, use, uh, use the street planter option. Uh, your input data should be accounted for in your street planters. And the footprints of rain gardens, street planters, and infiltration basins uh, should be counted as meadow or lawn as well. And lastly, uh, like we said before, the footprints of the permeable pavement and the green roofs should be counted as impervious when you're when you're inputting these numbers as well. Okay. Uh, last year's grant cycle was the first year that we uh, offered funding to cover the first year of maintenance after the construction of the practice is completed. Uh, we will be doing that again this year. And um, so your grant application itself must account for the expenses related to the first 12 months of maintenance uh, so that we have that money set aside to help you get through and learn how to maintain the practice. The reason we did this is because we we found that our applicants generally understand how to maintain practices, but they just don't, they, they kind of underestimate what it really takes to maintain them and how much it costs to maintain them. Uh, so we want to uh, uh, help expedite your knowledge of that and get you prepared for future maintenance years. Uh, the first year of maintenance is the most critical, especially if you have a plant-based practice like bioretention. Uh, it's important that those plants live and that weeds do not take over those beds. And uh, really, it, it's a reality check. <laughs> um, it's a man-made practice. All man-made practices need maintenance. Uh, so you're going to have to know, understand what you're what you're investing in and what it's going to take to do it. 
and of course we will be there to help you along the way. OK, so again, as far as your application is concerned, consist, concern and your budget is uh, taken into account, um, include that cost estimate for that first year of maintenance. Be as detailed as possible. Make sure you account for labor that it takes to do it. Any materials you'll need, you know, are you going to need to replenish that mulch? Are you going to need to replenish any kind of stone on top of your permeable pavers? That type of thing. How much landscaping is going to be needed? Do you need to rent equipment to do your maintenance? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, are you going to have contracts with your local uh, landscaper to perform this maintenance? And maybe they do it all. You know, you need to take that in consideration and tell, tell us what that budget number is estimated to be. You can do the work yourself um, and or you can utilize landscaping firms through contracts to do the work as well. Uh, but the reimbursement process that will take place, uh, it works the same as the reimbursement process that you will be utilizing for the grant dollars uh, during the design and construction phase. So quickly, uh, just to give you a little uh, background, any control measures that have landscaping with the plants, make sure you address weeding, watering, mulching, trash removal. If you have pre-treatment devices that need to be cleaned on occasion, that all needs to be uh, considered as part of the, the labor and the equipment that you need to do that. If you have porous pavement, uh, you're going to need to account for budgeting uh, sweeping of that at least two times up to four times per year on that first year. And if, if it's a really good sweeper, it might suck up some of the stone between the pavers if you use pavers, so you may need to replenish that stone um, as it as it's um, removed by the the sweeping uh, in vacuums. Rainwater harvesting systems uh, need frequent inspection, need cleaning. You got to test the equipment. Every a lot of mechanicals uh, often associated with rainwater harvesting. Winterizing is a big deal as far as uh, the labor needed to uh, prep it for winter and then again prep it for use in the springtime. And then infiltrating control measures frequently, or they should always have a pretreatment device of some type to keep sediments out of it. Uh, so cleaning of it, trash removal of some of the same things as uh, the landscape materials. And uh, last but not least for my part, um, if you need more technical information, we have a, a fact sheet on our website um, and that's the link to it. I am available for, to take phone calls at any time to help walk you through any technical issues and technical questions you have. Uh, happy to help out any way we can, and um, we'll get you through the process and make it as painless as possible. So that concludes the technical side of things. I'm going to hand it back over to Crystal uh, to talk about the reimbursement process. Thank you, Chris. Chris. We go into the, the uh, procedure in the process. I'm going to pause here, check uh, with Matt on, on questions that might be in the chat that we weren't able to address as we were going along. So we'll, we'll pause to check for questions at this point. Crystal, we've been able to kind of keep track with questions, so no new questions to cover at this point. Excellent. All right. So we'll dive into next slide, Chris. We'll dive a little into uh, the reimbursement procedure and the process and how things are, are packaged for you to be able to submit. Uh, our reimbursement procedure says that 100% of the funds that are used must be used toward activities and expenses related to the GI component of the project and is submitted for approval. There are times when your project is larger than the GI components um, and so we're obviously only reimbursing for the components that are associated with uh, the grant. Next slide, please. So just an idea of what those activities, what, what things are reimbursable. Uh, they include design, construction, first year maintenance, as Chris just went over, and of course, any signed package that you might have uh, to convey that component is also uh, reimbursable. Next slide, Chris. 
So once you've gotten um, an understanding of what can be reimbursed, there's a package that you need to prepare. It's basically a, a few forms. Uh, I'll go over what those forms are, and then I'll turn it over to Jessica Kotna, and she will provide you uh, information as to where those forms are on our website and how you might be able to utilize those forms to insert that information and, and attach any documents um, that you would need to submit that package. So there's a cover sheet, uh, and I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail. There's a cover sheet, there's a progress report, uh, there's an expense workshop uh, worksheet, and then there's uh, some supporting documentation. Uh, next slide, Chris. So that cover sheet is pretty much information about you, the applicant, or in this case, the grantee, um, and the project itself. So personal number, project information, project title, um, the amount that you're actually requesting. And ultimately you will be attaching your supporting documentation to this cover sheet form. Next slide, Chris. Progress report is as it's stated, it is just a summary of where you are at that project uh, at that point in time. The progress reports are submitted quarterly. Um, those dates would be incorporated into your agreement. Um, you would submit that information. If you are doing just a progress report, of course, you would submit just that form with the cover sheet. But if you are submitting a reimbursement, you will need to also incorporate a progress report with that. We want in this progress report, you know, any opportunity that you might find that there are issues or concerns and delays um, in uh, design or construction that you would incorporate those uh, pieces of information into the progress report as well. And of course, any uh, tabs, task and construction schedule, those types of things would also be incorporated into your progress report. And finally, any pictures along the way that you can incorporate would also be in the progress report and you'll have an opportunity to attach those pics um, in your progress report so that you can have that submitted as one package. Next slide. Ultimately, those supporting documentations, which is I probably would say most critical, um, that you would provide, it would be the invoices, the proof of uh, the process that where you are and the invoices associated with them. And of course, any canceled checks uh, that you would have associated with that portion. The reimbursement process itself can be submitted various times throughout the project. You don't have to wait for a progress report quarterly to be able to submit your reimbursements. But if you're going to do so, you will definitely need to incorporate a progress report with that reimbursement. So that kind of gives you an idea of the package and forms that you'll need to uh, utilize to be able to submit that reimbursement. Next slide. Once you've got that package prepared and you're able to submit that successfully, uh, it'll be reviewed by the district and then it'll take about 30 to 60 days for that process to complete itself before you would actually receive a reimbursement check. Next slide, Chris. So that's the reimbursement process and it's a package, it's basically a few forms. Those forms uh, can be found online. Uh, Jessica Cotton will take you through what those forms look like and how you can retrieve them and insert them into your package. Jessica. Hi, uh, can you hear me, Crystal? Yes, Hi. Can you I apologize. Okay. <laughs> I'm Jessica Cotton with the sewer district. I'm the GIS technician. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go over uh, and reiterate some of the information that Crystal just went over about the forms and how to find them online. Um, second. OK, so we have one web. We have our, our green infrastructure on our website. If you want to go um, the short version, it's in here. Again, the um, the PowerPoint presentation will be available um, online as well. But um, if you just type in NERSD.org and then go through our stormwater tab and then funding, 
opportunities and then our green infrastructure program. It lands you um, in our green infrastructure web page. This web page has most, if not all, information forms um, that you need for the program. Um, so our online forms, we are actually developing our website, um, uh, making some improvements to make it a little bit user friendly. So um, like Crystal said, there are three actually online forms that will um, take you through the process of when you um, start your project. Um, the one is the reimbursement request, which is option one. And then option two is the green infrastructure project uh, progress report. And option three is the green infrastructure request for project extension. Um, all three of these options do require the progress report, um, but um, the reimbursement has a couple of um, other steps that are required to um, complete that process. Um, so the reimbursement re request has three, three um, steps to complete this process. The one is the progress report that I mentioned. This is a Word document that you can just fill out um, all the information you need um, about the progress of your project. And then a little below, I only show the first um, the first um, page, but a little below you can add um, pictures or anything to support that progress um, within your project. Um, the second form is uh, called the Reimbursement Request Expense Tracking Form. This form um, is used to um, line item all the credit card receipts, cancel checks, anything that deals with the money, you line item them here. Um, this is just a chart that um, you can just fill, it's a fillable PDF. And then once you're done with steps um, one and two, and then you have all your supporting documents, you go online to our green infrastructure grant um, program reimbursement uh, cover sheet. This part of um, the step, it just asks you for basic information about the project, and then it has steps. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I just went through that. Um, it has steps to um, upload all the information. So once you're done with your green your pro progress report. Um, you want to save that to your desktop somewhere, and then it has an option to um, upload the file. The same thing with the request expense tracking form, and then the same thing with the supporting documents. All the documents and the forms are, again, are found at our website. Um, you can go to NERSD, but back a few, um, slides, there is a direct link. Um, so um, another thing that we that we um, highlight is our current um, and past green infrastructure awarded projects. As you can see on the left hand side, you see all of our projects within our um, combined sewer area service area. And um, you can see we highlighted the 2021s. Um, and you can see you can also this map is showing you some gapped areas that um, could use some green infrastructure in these areas. So maybe keep that in mind. Another thing that we highlight is all of our green infrastructure projects within a GIS story map. Um, if you click on any of these projects here, it shows you detailed information of the applicant, um, what watershed it's in, and some detailed information on fact sheets about the projects as well. <clears throat> so again, all that information is found in our website. Um, and if you have any questions, just let us know. Um, here are some important dates, next steps. Um, there's a pre-application meeting. That's July 28th through July 30th. Um, these are opportunities for uh, us, NERSD, to meet with the applicants to discuss the projects prior to their submittal. 
these um, have been very beneficial um, in the past. Um, and then September 13th of this year is the submit submission deadline. And again, um, down below um, the date is where the applicant's portal is, where you can submit your application. Okay, so that's the end of the presentations. Is there any questions? Jessica, we have a, a really good question uh, from the group uh, in terms of what what uh, insights we can provide um, in terms of the competitiveness of the program from year to year. So I'll just open that up to our our, our staff to uh, to just try to give some um, sense of how many applications we typically see in any given year. Um, and how many uh, awards that we try to uh, accomplish each year. I'll, I'll start with um, uh, that question. The application process um, in terms of application intake can vary from year to year. Of course, 2020 was um, a year uh, where, you know, things were just not normal. Uh, and so we were able to still proceed with uh, 2021 awards, but um, the amount awarded and the uh, budget for that year was, of course, skewed uh, because of the pandemic. But in general, you know, you can range anywhere from 15 to 25 uh, applications in a round. Uh, of course, if that is the case, then, you know, we're, those criteria that we mentioned earlier in the presentation would be um, the things that we would look at with great detail. And again, the proposal itself is like a story. So you're providing us a story in uh, a written documentation of how your project uh, would best fit our program. So the more information, the better, the easier it is for us to understand exactly what you're trying to convey and that you were able to put that down um, and articulate that, that we can follow that uh, will, of course, assist you. The visibility of that project, of course, will um, also uh, warrant if there's some um, issues of where your project lies. Can we see it from um, the street? Is it visible from the, for the public to see? Would they be able to understand that your project is, in fact, a green infrastructure project? So those are some of the ideas and information that we would be looking for. Um, it is competitive indeed. So it changes with all of those applications within that round. And I'll turn it over to Chris if there are any other technical aspects of that that will assist him with answering that question. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, I think you covered most of it. Um, you know, with the, the 1.5 million that we have available this year, um, you know, we should be able to fund at least six projects at the at the $250,000 max request uh, that we established. Uh, but not all projects come in at that level, so uh, hopefully we can get some more. Um, but uh, I don't really have any much more to add than that uh, to what you said. Thank you. All right, thanks. And we have one more question about uh, posting the, the slide deck. I think we've commented that uh, we'll we'll post the recorded presentation uh, to our web page and, and we'll send out a, a link for that. Um, Crystal, will we also be able to uh, obviously we'll save the slide deck itself minus the recording. Uh, can we send a, a link for that as well so that folks could uh, download at their at their pleasure? Yes, the slide deck and the recording will be posted on that web on our website. Uh, that reference that Jessica made to where all of that information is usually housed, the slide deck will be there uh, under that information. And eventually, I would say within the next two weeks, you would be able to receive that this recording of the presentation as well. So both formats will be on our website for you to uh, retrieve. And if anybody has trouble uh, navigating to that website or can't quite get things they need, 
Uh, are you the best email address to reach out to? Absolutely. I'll take care of any inquiries that come. If you have a problem, feel free to give me a call or an email. OK, I'm just putting my eyes on the chat to see if there are any other questions. We'll give it a minute to see if anyone has any final thoughts or questions that might come posed uh, while we're wrapping up. Hey, Crystal, this is Chris. I just wanted to add one comment. Um, during the uh, discussion about the evaluation cr criteria, uh, the uh, we discussed briefly uh, the submittal of a what we deem a complete design uh, can potentially earn you 10 extra points on your evaluation as we score these out. I just wanted to let folks know that uh, a complete design is not a approved design. <laughs> OK, uh, complete design is basically you have uh, invested uh, time and money to uh, have a drawings uh, developed that uh, for the most part show us what you want to do uh, and provide the details uh, that would typically uh, be seen on a an approved construction set of plans. Uh, but that's still uh, if you're if you're fortunate enough to uh, be awarded the grant, uh, we still will need to go through a review and approval process for those plans uh, before uh, we can uh, say you're ready for construction. So just for points of clarity, uh, the 10 points, the additional 10 points that Chris is referring to, you do receive that as you're submitting that proposal if that information is there. He's referring to if you are awarded the grant and that that design would need to still be submitted for uh, review and approval. Okay, good. Thanks, Crystal and Chris. Uh, one more question on the pre-application meetings, uh, whether they are required, mandatory or not. Um, they are not required, um, but they are uh, highly suggested. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get your project in front of us uh, to get at least uh, uh, an initial evaluation and some direction on how to improve your application. Um, so I would, if you're interested in applying for a project, uh, I would highly recommend uh, scheduling the pre-application meetings, and that can be done through uh, Crystal Davis. Yes, that's correct. Feel free to just shoot me an email that you are interested in a pre-proposal meeting, and um, I will shoot you back uh, the available dates and times that are available for those pre-proposal meetings. Um, during the time of the 28th through the 30th of July. I think we've got through. Yep, I've not seen any new questions in the chat crystal so uh, if there aren't any further questions from any of the attendees i think we can uh, wrap it up a little bit ahead of schedule and on a friday i don't think anybody will be bummed that you uh, get to leave 30 minutes early feel free to email any of us if you have any questions past this point um, and if you don't know who to email feel free to send your emails to me and I will filter those to the appropriate person for comment or questions if not I will say thank you very much for joining our pre-proposal workshop and have a great day